This Week in Startups is brought to you by Embroker. The Embroker Startup Insurance Program helps startups secure the most important types of insurance at a lower cost and with less hassle. Save up to 20% off of traditional insurance today at Embroker.com slash twist. While you're there, get an extra 10% off by using offer code twist. LinkedIn Jobs. A business is only as strong as its people, and every hire matters. Post your first job for free at linkedin.com slash twist and checkout.com. With checkout.com, your business can innovate, adapt to your markets, and make smarter financial decisions faster. If your business takes payments online, you need checkout.com. Learn more at checkout.com slash twist. Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. Welcome to a very special episode of This Week in Startups. We got a Slack room with like 30,000 founders in it, and we read books together, and we have a book club. You can go to thisweekinstartups.com slash Slack, and you can sign up for our Slack room. It's a bit of chaos, uh, but the book club is really the highlight for me. And we, um, we asked fans of the show to tell us which books to read. And one of the books that came up that people said over and over and over again was very um, applicable to their day-to-day was a book called No Rules, Rules, Netflix and the Culture of Reinvention. And we uh, had a great book club around it. We talked about a lot of the different, I would say, iconoclastic, the the iconoclastic worldview of the Netflix team, uh, Reid Hoffman amongst them, a developer who is known for maybe being a little hardcore. The Netflix culture deck ripped through Silicon Valley over a decade ago, and most people were aghast at how um, brutal it was (laughs) at times, but the people... Did I say Reed Hoffman? I'm not Reed Hastings. Sorry, I always do that. Um, Reed Hastings' uh, approach to leadership and hiring and talent management, which is the core of what we do in Silicon Valley and startups, it was a little perplexing to people and it needed to be unpacked. And when you unpack it, and unpack it he did with his co author, Aaron Meyer, uh, who is on the program today, uh, you actually understand a little bit of the method behind the madness and maybe how to apply it yourself and maybe even on the margins where people were misinterpreting maybe what is considered a very hardcore approach to humans. Aaron, welcome to the program. And and you yourself say in the book that you were a little bit aghast by some of the slogans, credos, best practices that Netflix had when you uh, laid eyes on them. So welcome to the program and, and tell us what do you... What do you do for a living? And how did you wind up writing this book with Reed? Yeah, hi, Jason. So nice to be here with you. Um, so I am a professor at INSEAD, which is a business school outside of Paris. I'm joining you from Paris today. And I study organizational behavior, but I'm an expert in cross-cultural management. So my first book, The Culture Map, was all about uh, national cultural differences in the workplace. And um, then at one point, you know, like very many people, I came across the, the Netflix culture deck, which I mean, if your listeners haven't heard of it, it's been downloaded like 20 million times. And I think many, uh, many of the listeners have heard of it. Um, And when I first looked through it, I was, yeah, I was really taken aback. I mean, I loved on the one hand, I love that there was like so much honesty. (laughs) But on the other hand, um, there were these things in it, like there was this slide that said, um, at Netflix, adequate performance gets a generous severance. And that really confused me because at net at INSEAD, we had been, um, researching this whole idea that if you wanted to create an innovative work environment, you really had to focus on psychological safety, right? Oh. Psychological safety was all the buzz. God so now almighty, with the psychological safety. <laughs> Explain to the audience what psychological safety means, because this to me is very <laughs> triggering about snowflake millennial culture. What does this mean, psychological safety in the workplace? Yeah, well, so the the term was uh, was developed by a, a Harvard professor, Amy Edmondson, and uh, I mean, basically, the the main idea behind it is that you want to create a workplace where people feel safe to speak up and to share their ideas. But I also at that time had this kind of um, greater understanding that if people felt, let's say, comfy, <laughs> right, mm-hmm. uh, that then they would be more creative. <laughs> Right. Okay. You're laughing because what we've all realized in the hardcore 
elite practice of, you know, running these, you know, world changing companies is that we very rarely see this kumbaya safety approach. And we typically see marauding packs of samurais and SWAT teams, basically creating very uncomfortable conditions in order to have elite performance. And anybody who watched the Michael Jordan documentary, The Last Dance, would say there is a distinct lack of psychological safety on the Bulls team. I don't know if you saw the documentary. I did. I did. Yes, I'm sure you course. did. Just right off the bat. It's just a perfect, you know, kind of uh, microcosm of the book and everything uh, and his philosophy and their philosophy. Is it which do you fall on? Do you want to curate psychological safety? Or do you want people on edge saying, you know what, I got to perform this year because come January 2022, I might be out of a job if I don't bring it. Right. So, I mean, so that's, that's the, that's the big question. I mean, I don't know. Are you asking me what I prefer? Yeah. What do you, well, <laughs> what do you personally? think? What do I no. think breeds, breeds success? <laughs> yeah, who, who cares what people think personally? What right. people care about is what's going to result in a Netflix, well, of course. Tesla, Uber, Google, Apple outcome. Yeah, well, I can tell you, I mean, I'm pretty certain, um, having now lived uh, these couple of years kind of in Netflix and with Netflix, so I conducted 200 interviews, right, with with Netflix employees. Um, I I really see that when people are given, we'll talk more about it, this, right, but when people are given a lot of freedom to, um, to do what, what they believe in, right, like to take on projects that they really feel will have the biggest impact that they get these, let's say, like adrenaline rushes, right? Yes. And that it's a general rush of, let's say, motivation. Now, do we feel comfortable when we've been given a lot of freedom to make a big decision, uh, maybe use a lot of money from the company, maybe, you know, do something even that our bosses don't believe in, but we believe it's going to work out. Does that make us feel comfortable? Well, no, we don't feel comfortable, uh, but we feel excited. <laughs> we feel like we jump up in the uh, morning, out of, jump out of bed, and we think, oh my gosh, I, I'm going to get started, <laughs> right? Um, so I, I do believe that, um, I do believe that that idea of giving people this kind of a lot of freedom and then also telling them, you know, if we find that you don't have good judgment over a period of time, you won't be here anymore. I do think that that actually does work in creating a lot of motivation. So this is a very nuanced point. And I think that this is where, you know, nuance seems to be have been lost in, you know, because of social media and tweets. But in a podcast, we can really get into nuance is one of the great things about this format. So as we unpack this, and I think it really needs to be unpacked, if you want to have elite performance, it's not just about people having pressure under them. It's that they have opted into taking on responsibility. So if a person does not want responsibility, they need not take that seat. But if you do choose to sit in the pilot's seat in a fighter pilot or a fighter jet, and you have to make decisions, and it's a $100 million airplane, you opted to sit in that seat. That's what people sometimes miss about psychological safety. You know, an astronaut who gets on the tip of a rocket ship or somebody who goes a fighter pilot or whatever it happens to be, they're not opting into safety, they're opting into adventure. Correct? That's right. Okay, so that's clear. It's clear that the people who work at Netflix, um, they go there because they want to, they want to do big things. They want to do big things. They have high ambitions and they're willing to take some career risk in mm -hmm. order to make it happen. But I think it's also useful to take a step back. I mean, my, I think my, my biggest overwhelming learning from doing this work, uh, work with Reed and at Netflix was that, um, most companies today and most of what we're teaching in business school is actually a, a hangover from the industrial era. And, you know, what I mean by that is that, of course, during the industrial era, which powered our economy for a long time, so of course, we're still doing those things. Uh, but during the industrial era, we were focused on error prevention, you know, maximizing efficiency, replicability and consistency, because that was what we needed when we had, uh, when we had these industrial plants. And of course, you know, some of your, your listeners, I imagine, are working in these kinds of situations today where error prevention, and replicability is their primary goal. But, you know, in a, in a growing number of organizations and teams today, the, the biggest goal is no longer error prevention or consistency. The biggest goal is innovation and flexibility. And if we're gonna, if we're gonna, um, it's almost the opposite, right? So if we're gonna turn yeah, towards it is, innovation in and fact. flexibility. 
yeah, we have to think differently, right? I mean, I think it's it's really worth unpacking there because if you were trying to make, you know, take Starbucks from 10 locations to 1000 locations, you're not looking for each Starbucks manager who comes in to want to light a fire under the asses of their <laughs> baristas and and make them feel unsafe every day coming to work and overall feeling unsafe when they go to a new city. You want them to consistently produce a frappuccino that if I taste it in Shanghai or Singapore, you know, or Salt Lake City, it tastes the same. That's what you're going for, it, just as one metaphor amongst many. But if you look at a company like Uber, when they were deploying, they took a and I think Netflix had a similar approach, which is the general manager in this city, this geolocation is in charge. Here's their budget, innovate. You got your, you're the CEO of, you know, Uber or Netflix, Norway, Las Vegas, whatever the, the geo is, and go for it. Spend the money how you want to spend it. But that is nerve wracking because some people, maybe a lot of these MBAs, I'll be totally honest, no offense, they might want a playbook. They want, might want you to tell them, how do I execute? How do I get the high score? Because MBAs, let's face it, they've been trained their entire life, if you get into Harvard or Stanford, on how to ace tests. So there are a bunch of, you know, rote learners who, you know, go in and run these companies. That is part of the conflict here is the entrepreneurial pirates versus these rote, you know, high uh, scoring aptitude test people, right? That's right. And I think it's very interesting that you mentioned Starbucks versus Uber. Yeah. Uh, because as we, as you say, unpack this a little bit more, I think we can see there's really two very different companies there in that, of course, uh, Starbucks is going for air error prevention and replicability as they open up their and maximizing efficiency as they open up their stores around the world. But their product is not a safety critical product, which means that um, process is less critical. <laughs> Right. Mm -hmm. So we can talk more about that in a few minutes. But Uber, of course, has a safety critical product. So if you have, if you give people a ton of freedom and you don't focus on error prevention, that might actually lead to some, you know, some big dangers. Right. Yeah. Um, and they did okay. actually, in right. fact, have issues around maybe uh, vetting drivers in some locations. And sometimes it was fair and sometimes it was unfair. I mean, Uber was held to a higher standard as a technology company with some new technology, but it was universally safer because they were tracking every ride we can put that aside but hey everybody i want to take a minute to thank imbroker for sponsoring this week in startups and supporting us all year long what a great company and it's very simple you need to have insurance i don't know how many times i got to talk to you about this you have to have insurance for your company it's time to grow up and it's time to save money and to do it online quickly and easily. And Brokers Technology will let you save a ton of time and a ton of money. Prices are 20% lower and you get better coverage than all these crazy incumbents who are slow. That's not what you want. You want cyber insurance, so if you get hacked, you're covered. You want DNO insurance, directors and officers. You're the officers of the company, not like police officers, officers as in executives, and directors are the people on your board. You need DNO if you're gonna have a board, if you're gonna have officers in a company, so that if something happens and you get sued, you're gonna be covered. And errors and omission insurance. It's called ENO. This means if you make a mistake and Major customers are going to ask for ENO insurance if they want to buy your product. And finally, this Employment Practices Liability, EPL. So you're going to talk to your attorney about cyber, DNO, ENO, and finally EPL. And the best place to get insurance today is at embroker.com slash twist, E M B R O K E R dot com slash twist where if you use the offer code twist you will get 10 percent off they do a great job they do many of my companies in broker.com slash twist get that 10 percent off using the offer code twist there is something about speed where if you have the generals in the field making the decisions the person running the special ops team going into you know uh kill uh, Osama bin Laden, like you want them to be able to make on the fly decisions when that chopper has a, a rotor go bad. Y you don't want somebody in command and control making that decision, correct? That's right. So um, you were talking earlier about uh, about psychological safety and how important it is to make our, our employees feel safe. But I think that one of the big things that um, that 
that people have been missing when they've been kind of looking at the Netflix culture is that this isn't actually about like safety I mean, or, or lack of safety. That's not the big question, right? The big question is freedom, right? So it's, it's the freedom that breeds the success. And I'm just going to, Jason, I'm just going to tell a quick story from the book, if you don't mind, but I think it's kind of like the most important story to illustrate the point. So when I first interviewed Reed, he told me this story about his first company, right? Which was this organization. And peer software. And when he opened peer software, like most small entrepreneurial companies, it was just a small group of people who were operating, let's say fast and loose, right? So they had, they had no, no rules or process that were guiding the way they worked. They were just using their judgment to do the best they could for the good of the company, right? But then the company grew. And it grew to a couple hundred people, a couple thousand people. And of course, as it grew, some people did stupid things and other people took advantage of the freedom. So Reed responded to that by, uh, by putting in, in place, you know, a lot of process like KPIs and MBOs and, uh, and rules like travel policies and vacation policies, right? So he, he dummy proofed the system. <laughs> Right. Uh, but as he always says, what I didn't realize is that if you dummy proof the system, only dummies want to work there. Right. So then as that, as all those processes started to kind of take root, uh, a couple of things happened. And one is that the most, like, say, like crazy mavericky employees and the ones who were really adding, let's say, kind of the most innovative value to the organization, they left because they didn't want to work in a place that they had a lot of controls. And then uh, the people who were really good at following process, they were, of course, promoted into senior positions. Right. They drew within the lines. That's right. And they were not the most flexible people on the planet. So, uh, so when the environment shifted from C++ to Java, they were not able to, to shift quickly. And Reed had to sell the company. So with his next organization, which was Netflix, he had these kind of oh, um, underpinning lessons, which was employee freedom breeds innovation and uh, process kills organizational flexibility. So that now, he, you know, he often talks about operating Netflix on the edge of chaos. And I think we can see here uh, um, how that kind of freedom then creates a sort of fertile environment for all of this innovation to take place. And that's really the, the key point, right? All of the other aspects, they're just put in place to give the to give the people the freedom they need to innovate. And this is why I think it's important you, you all read the book, because you have to get the full 360 degree view of what's happening here because if you pull out specific pieces of the culture of the culture deck or something you've heard or a story or you know a little anecdote it, it's it's more the holistic a process you can't just take away all the rules because if you have a bunch of people who love checking the boxes they are in fact going to lose their minds because they're going to say just tell me what to do and then you might have people who go to town and abuse the fact that there's no policies like unlimited vacation or no vacation policy or no travel policy two of the most polarizing things that i want to ask you about next all right so the two polarizing things i think uh that come to mind that people have heard from the outside that we should unpack and just put in context number one the travel policy uh, expense policy, and the vacation policy. These are kind of things that employees are always fascinated with. I find people put too many cycles on them. But it's just kind of the nature people really care about and covet their vacation days, it's become a bit of a game and a gaming of the system. And then obviously expenses are a never ending game that people play some people just look at what are the max limits I can do and they try to game it when I was starting my career, I was working at Sony Music, at the dawn of the internet age, people would buy business class tickets, downgrade them to coach, take the cash uh, or credits, and then use the that to buy tickets from their vacation. It was, or people would, when we were, people would get stacks of receipts from their friends, and they would just fill out their own receipts and then bring peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, but put, you know, hamburger fries, $12. And that, that was how like the, the middle class that Sony made an extra two thousand dollars a year in bonus was by putting in fugazi uh, receipts let's talk about those no vacation policy i heard from people was like people didn't take their vacations they were under so much pressure nobody would ever approve them yada 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 explain how that was deployed 
And if people wound up ultimately taking more vacation, less vacation, or about the same. Right. Okay. So the Netflix. Yeah. So the Netflix policy at the the vacation policy at Netflix is take some. Okay. So there is a policy. (laughs) Yes. And they Um, do actually work on the words in these policies. (laughs) That's right. (laughs) Um, Take some. So uh, yeah. And the, I mean, just like another example, a newer, a newer one, their, their maternity and paternity policy is uh, do what's best for you and your baby. Okay. That one's new since the book came out. So, yeah, I mean, I was really concerned about this, too, when I first read about it. I thought, well, you know, one of two things is going to happen, right? Either people are taking no vacation at all, which is, you know, bad for them and bad for their families and ultimately not good for the company, or people are on vacation all the time, (laughs) <laughs> which is like the entrepreneur is a nightmare. Um, but uh, so at Netflix, they talk about leading with context, not control. And what that means is there aren't any like, you know, policies telling you how, what what number of days you can and cannot take off. But uh, you do get a lot of, um, of soft guidelines from your manager and the leaders around you about, you know, what they expect people to be doing, right? So, um, I mean, one of the things that's uh, quite interesting when working with Reed is that he takes uh, six weeks of vacation a year and he talks a lot about his vacation. There's so a little I- peacocking going on here about vacations. <laughs> uh, but... Um, there was a but, reason for that. That's right. I mean, the reason to do that is that if he doesn't take vacation, if he does, if people don't see their boss taking vacation, it's clear they're not going to take vacation, right? Um, so, I mean, imagine that you're hired into a company and they say, okay, the vacation policy is take some. At first, that sounds really exciting. And then you arrive and you're like, okay, well, what are other people doing, right? And then you look at what they're doing and you try to do kind of the same. And, you know, that's human nature. So if you see that your boss is taking six weeks of vacation and those around you are taking, uh, you know, five or six weeks of vacation, then you're likely to do the same thing. And if you don't, if you only take one week and people start saying to you, huh, seems like you haven't been on vacation in a long time, right? Or they're showing one another all their pictures of vacation and you never have any pictures, right? That's really, I think, actually very powerful. So what I did see at Netflix, I mean, when the company was smaller, they really focused on this um, on this modeling, right? These modeling of these kind of soft messages. So, you know, for example, Reed taking six weeks of vacation and talking about it a lot and his managers all being encouraged to take a lot of vacation and talk about it a lot. So then it just works, right? But, you know, when I, Netflix is now a bigger place. So I did certainly see a lot more variance from one one part of the company to another, depending on what the leader of that department was doing. Uh, you know, and that's but that's I would say that doesn't bother Reed too much because when you're operating on the edge of chaos, you will have a lot of inconsistencies. And you know, the best that he can do is kind of try to continually get a feel and really encourage those areas where he sees burnout or things aren't working well, really encourage people to, you know, take the time off. Well, and when you think about it, if if he is really up against, and he knew that this day would come, the Disney pluses of the world would show up, and he would not, you know, just have a straight path to, you know, sweeping up the Marvel films and Marvel series and putting them on Netflix. At some point, he was going to have to go head to head with some really serious competition. He wanted a fast team that could sprint. And if the team is going from an all out sprint for 26 miles, versus very serious competitors, and you've got to stop and say, let's debate you know, uh, our travel policy, or ha- let's look at how many days people have taken off. It's a waste of time. It's a waste of time that could be put into finding the next orange is the new black or queen's gambit or whatever it is that move the needle for correct. That's that was his main point. Yeah, well, and I think that actually the main reason that they don't have the vacation policy or the travel policy, it's just symbolic, right? And right. Uh, you know, the symbol. Oh, is- really? Oh, okay. sure. I thought it was more practical than symbolic. Oh, well, certainly he doesn't want the, the wasted times and the process. But, um, you know, these symbols, they're important. The symbol, look, um, I trust you. I trust you to live your life the way you want to live your life. And, you know, you should be the person you want to be. And, you know, you're adults. So then people, oh, okay, I'm trusted here. Here I can, ah. I can organize my life however I want. So now right. I'm, I'm going to really behave in a way that shows you that you were right in giving me that trust. And, you know, those symbols, I think, are actually quite powerful in encouraging responsibility. 
It's a new year, thank goodness. And we have so many people to hire here at Launch, and, which is our investment company, and This Week in Startups. We're hiring a full-time community manager. We need an operations person, actually two, because there's so many syndicates going on. We need a second producer for this podcast and a third video editor. It's crazy how fast things are growing. We're trying to get to five days a week. And you know what? Uh, we're getting there, but we need more people. And you know where we're finding them? We're finding them all on LinkedIn Jobs, obviously. And we love using LinkedIn Jobs here at Launch because we can manage all of our job posts and our candidates from a single view. And you can even contact the candidates because obviously they're in the LinkedIn interface. So it's so streamlined. It's so simple, which is what I like. I like efficiency. I like getting things done. I want these three or four new positions I got filled pronto. Whether you're like shifting your business hours or hiring more remote employees, the one thing that remains unchanged is having the right people on your team. You need to have the right people on the bus before you decide where you're going. Get the right people on your bus and do it with LinkedIn. When your business is ready to make that next hire, what I want you to do is use LinkedIn by going to linkedin.com slash twist. They're going to post your first job for free. I mean, it's an incredible, incredible offer. They have over 722 million members worldwide. So they mean business. And you really don't have to overthink this one, folks. LinkedIn is going to find you the right person and they're going to find you that person faster. Go to linkedin.com slash twist twist. Okay, let's get back to this amazing episode. That's the FNR that they talk about. So you have <laughs> the freedom to do what you want, but you have to be responsible. And it does build loyalty as well, right? It, the, yeah. the, if you trust people, they're loyal to you and they have much lower voluntary turnover. Uh, they have the overall the same amount of turnover. But the percentage that's voluntary versus involuntary is inverse of most companies. Can you explain that and why? that is important to him and, you know, uh, overall a good lesson. Yeah. So also, I should finish answering your question about the vacation policy, which is that overall, people take about a the same amount of vacation as they do at another company. I mean, okay, so that's what we find in the end, right? Okay, but then... If yeah, but hold on. And, and also in that situation, it's important to note that some people take less, and then you will have somebody who abuses it. But like credit card abuse, you don't want to slow down 100 transactions at Starbucks, where people want to get in and out to ask people for their driver's license, if one out of, you know, $100 is fraud, you'd rather eat the dollar in fraud and not inconvenience the other 99 purchasers to take out their driver's license, correct? That is kind of how they look at it. Oh, that's it's clear. So um, earlier, you were bringing up the the no expense policy, and the no travel policy. And you know, people always say, but I don't get it, right? I mean, of course, people will take advantage of that freedom. And the the CFO and the, their, uh, a previous CVS CFO did tell me that he thought that the the travel costs were probably about 10% more at Netflix than they would would need to be if they had travel policies. But the benefits that they get from having giving employees freedom and letting them feel like, oh, you're, you're an adult, we treat you like an adult. That was way beyond the benefit was way beyond the 10%. But I think when you want to think about abusing the system, I mean, uh, that's the big worry, how can we reduce the error? And we did find some right, we talked about about those things about oh my this Lord, guy. There was one person running scams. Yeah. <laughs> there was that guy in Taiwan. Right? Yeah. It was <laughs> he, like, I'm going to pay myself and consulting firms and all this kind of stuff. Yeah. Round tripping. Yeah. One who took a hundred, it was like over a hundred thousand dollars in personal travel. Uh, for him and his family over a four year period. And he didn't get caught because, uh, because his manager didn't look at the, the receipts and managers at Netflix, they can look at the receipts. I mean, they come in every month and some do and some don't. And then they do an audit every year where they look at portions of the company. So eventually he was caught, right? But the big, you know, the big lesson, uh, is when you find one person <laughs> who behaves irresponsibly, don't punish the rest of the company by putting rules in place, right? Just deal with that one individual and deal with them loudly and then continue to uh, to increase freedom for the rest of the employees. Yeah, so that's, uh, that's, that's that where they're going. It takes a tolerance for ambiguity that few people seem to have in leadership positions. The ability to say like, yes, we're going to actually allow somebody to steal $100,000 so the other 10,000 employees can feel trusted. And that's the minor you know, tax we're going to pay. It's the minor, you know, percentage of overhang to to have this kind of freedom. Oh, I, I agree, Jason. And I think it makes people very uncomfortable because of our industrial era hangover. 
<laughs> I mean, we're, we're so we have got such a big headache from the industrial era. You fill out your we, TPS reports and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. That we think that leadership is about control. Even when we're talking about empowerment, we're all talking about empowerment, but we're still putting in place all of these systems to control our employees. It makes us feel nervous. To Going back to that. the safety part of this, what makes people feel more safe? Because I actually don't know, and I'm trying to figure it out in my head. Does it make people feel more safe to say you have this many vacation days, you can spend this much on a flight versus use your judgment and do what you think is in the best interest of Netflix, which well, one produces yeah. more psychological safety? Well, certainly um, giving people freedom makes them feel more in control of their own lives, right? So I don't really know how to answer the question. I guess that's that's dependent on the person, right? But, um, mo you know, people who want to feel in control of their own lives, they feel, I mean, it, I'll tell you, that's wonderful at Netflix. I had people tell me these stories, like, because they have so much freedom to work anywhere and work the hours that they want, you know, they organized all sorts of things, like, you know, going to do like research projects on uh, things that they loved in Brazil, <laughs> some months, and then coming back and working again or going to take care of their mother uh, every Tuesdays. So I do. Yeah, I think people want control over their own life. But of course, there's an element of um, am I doing the right thing? Right? Am I following the rules? Uh, right. So you have to get you have to get used to that. Right? Uh, talk a little bit about how they communicate with each other. Because this is a key to the freedom and responsibility is that we can have a conversation of what you actually accomplished when given this freedom and charged with the responsibility of making Netflix, you know, surge in Taiwan or Norway or whatever region you've been assigned to. And we don't even understand that region. I know that's part of your expertise is how these different cultures operate versus the, the rule book or the playbook, let's call it. It's probably better to call it a playbook. These heuristics have to meet the culture that people grew up in, right? And that yeah. is also a... Uh, communications issue. So let, let's move into the communications and how they communicate the stuff to people. Yeah. So um, at Netflix, they have a very strong focus on developing a, a feedback culture. And, you know, okay, there's this year today, there's nothing new about that. I mean, there's so many companies are talking, it seems to be like the huge new trend, everyone's talking about feedback and candor. Uh, but at Netflix, they've really got it down. <laughs> so um, so um, one of the things so first, let me say that despite the the amount that we talk about feedback, uh, um, most people don't like to give and receive feedback, right? Uh, so that's because of our amygdala, right? The amygdala is the most primitive part of your brain. And the amygdala, um, one of its main concerns is finding safety in numbers. Right. So, uh, so if you give someone a critical feedback about something they didn't do well, no matter what they're, what they'd like to do, their, their amygdala starts kind of sending off a siren. And that siren is, Oh, I might be kicked out of the group. Right. So my, my reflex is then fight or flight. Either I, either I deny it and I say, No, you know, it's not because of me. It's because of what you did. Right. Or I, or I flee. I, I, I don't want to talk to you again. <laughs> Right. Um, so because of that, that kind of like this primitive part of our brain, it's really hard to get that feedback going. That being said, we also see through a lot of research that not only does, does giving and and receiving a lot of feedback at work up the performance in the organization, but most employees actually say they want more of it. So mm. there was one. Are research they, are they actually? When they say they want more feedback, do they actually want more feedback or are they just saying they want more feedback? <laughs> well, I don't know. Do I mean? do not. I think what I think the deal is like if I think of myself, right? I think, OK, I want to know where my blind spots are, but it doesn't feel good for me to hear that. Right. So like I want to get it, but I don't look forward to the moment of it. Right? Right. It's like getting a shot or something or. Yeah. yeah, that's right. So 72% of employees in one big study said that um, said that they they felt that they would have better performance at work if they received more feedback, and they weren't getting enough of it. So just I mean, I think just simple things. I mean, like one one thing is putting feedback on the agenda, right? So like, if we have a, me a meeting every month that the first item on the agenda or the last item is feedback. And at the end of the meeting, you give me some feedback.
feedback about what you think I could do to improve and I give you some feedback. Right? It's super simple, right? But when you create those spaces for the feedback, suddenly I, I, I say, oh, I think I'll tell her that thing I wasn't going to tell her, right? Right. You're giving people the green light. And th- sometimes people, you know, we want to be polite to each other. We're, we want to create safety. We don't want to create animosity or, you know, uncomfortable feelings. So to give people the green light and say, and, and I think Ed Catmull does a good job of this at Pixar and under your Creativity Inc. Another really, it's a nice companion to your book, actually. Um, and it really does giving people that freedom, giving them that, you know, green light, hey, can you be candid with me and using the word candid, I guess has become it's kind of annoying now because that people are just saying it over and over again. Uh, but they don't want to say be honest, because if you say be honest, that means you were lying before you right. <laughs> were being honest. So <laughs> candid is like this higher level of uh, green light. Hey, do you have a business that accepts purchases, maybe orders online? Well, if you do, have you ever had a digital transaction not go through? And you're like, wait a second, the card worked. Person's telling me the card works. Well, this is called a false decline. And this happens when an online purchase is declined when it should have been accepted. So that's the technical term in the industry, false decline. And this is often the result of just like a technical or a financial or even a fraud score reason. You should have gotten that money. You should have had that transaction. You shouldn't have your customer frustrated with you and they blame it on you right because that's what happens it worked the card worked two other times it doesn't work on this website it reflects badly on you right last year false declines this is amazing cost us uk french and german markets over 20 billion dollars and that's why if your business takes payments online you need checkout.com i mean what an amazing domain name checkout.com if you run an e-commerce company this is a no-brainer you can't lose your valuable customers to something that is an unforced error right you're shooting yourself in the foot that just can't happen so here's a demo my associate press creating a free test account at checkout.com slash twist now if you're watching the video it's super easy he just has access to the checkout dashboard interface and it lets him play around he's got all the tutorial data and just sets it up so easy a permanent gateway into a squarespace website in seconds right and it works with all the other major platforms out there obviously so right now, go ahead and create a free test account. See how it works. The dashboard is gorgeous. It's very simple. Checkout.com slash twist. Checkout.com slash twist. And you'll see if their payment solution works for your business. I'm sure it will. Checkout.com slash twist. Is the Netflix group, and they're not listening, so you can be totally candid. Are the Netflix executives a little narcissistic in that they want too much feedback? Are they too self-absorbed? Because it seemed like they were getting into levels of feedback of, you know, hour long feedback sessions and this like, really intense feedback, that it almost felt a little cultish. Well, they do do things at Netflix that I thought were quite shocking. (laughs) Um, I don't think it had I don't think that has to do with uh, the leaders being self absorbed. I think it has to do with this really strong focus on, you know, how are we going to get the feedback out there? But the one right, the really crazy one is this, these 360 degree feedback dinners, right? Yes, that's what I'm thinking of is when they go to (laughs) dinner and just (laughs) annihilate each other. But that also felt a little self absorbed, like, Let's go to dinner and just talk about us. Yeah, but so Jason, I want to tell you when I first heard that, so what they do, right? They go out like once a year and, you know, just to be clear, it's not a process or a rule, which means that not every team does it, right? Right. You don't have to do it. There's not, not so, not, not many things at Netflix you have to do, but, um, many managers at Netflix choose to do these 360 feedback dinners at some point that they feel it would benefit their team. So they go out to dinner and, uh, or over a meal, over, several hours, right? And the deal is like, I'm up first. And we go around and each person at the table tells me what they think that I could do in order to improve my performance, right? And then we move on to the next person. And you know, my initial reaction to this was like, well, what's the point? Right? Like, what's the point of dragging my weaknesses in front of the whole team? I mean, why couldn't you tell me that in private? <laughs> Yeah, here's right. a note. Here's a little note. <laughs> right. This is what post-its are for, or email, or a quick SMS message, a Slack DM. This is what DMs are for. That's right. But I actually found out, realized that it has this incredible benefit, which is that like when one person gives you feedback, you always wonder, oh, well, I think that's maybe an issue about him, right? Agenda, right. What's her agenda? Yeah. 
yeah, you don't really know kind of what's what you should be working on or what you shouldn't be working on. And when you get together at a, as a team like that, then you you really see the picture clearly, right? Because one person might say, you know what, Aaron, you always speak so loud, it's just uh, crushing the rest of us. And then the next person might say, you know, I totally disagree with what Patricia just said, I love your energy and I definitely don't want you to adjust your voice tone. <laughs> no, well, good. So you can kind of level <laughs> set the feedback. Somebody might feel you're, I don't know, not uh, energetic enough. Another person might feel you're just perfect, right? And it, you can level set that. It might be, it's like when a group, do, you ever have a group do the Myers-Briggs together? Yeah. And you're like, <laughs> I can literally guess people's like ENTJ or something like that. Right. I got so good at it at one point. I was like, yeah, you're like, you know, INTJ, you're INTB. <laughs> like you could just kind of like, just from knowing the person, but then you know, like, oh shit, I'm like one of eight extroverts on this, in this group. The other seven people are introverts. Okay, that explains everything, right? That's that's right. So with this, right, then you leave feeling like, okay, well, now I understand what, you know, that person wants, thinks I should do differently, and that person I think I do differently. But really, I understand, you know, from the, the entire group, that one thing that I need to be working on. And many people said to me that although they found those dinners always uncomfortable moving into, mm. that they realized when they got there that, you know, everyone was trying to be helpful and they knew that they were being like watched by the team so they wanted to be kind and that it was the greatest the greatest developmental moments of their life that's what I often heard I actually started doing them at INSEAD and I could tell you I found them pretty useful Jason you did them as in a crazy. university setting yeah. in France <laughs> yeah. I have, yeah. I really? Have. have they <laughs> have they reported you to HR yet? <laughs> well, you know, we talked about it ahead of time, which is what they do at Netflix too, right? Like, what do you guys think? Do you think we could pull this off? Got do you it. Think get people to useful? opt into it. That's right. That's right. Yeah, because people could feel like you're ganging up on them, or, or I hate to say it as like you know an attack because right. people are so soft now that words are like an attack. I mean, they're just words. <laughs> it's just an opinion. But got a lot of snowflakes <laughs> out there who feel like words are. And you're in a university setting, like, it seems to me like a university is the exact <laughs> opposite of like Netflix, right? Oh, like, I mean, the concept of you. tenure is <laughs> the opposite of what happens at a Netflix, right? <laughs> Well, okay, maybe, yeah, but I don't need to go into INSEAD, but it actually, it is true. <laughs> it is true at my business school, too, that the faculty get a huge amount of freedom. And ah. because of that freedom, we have a lot of innovation. I mean, I, oh, I see good. the that clear, that parallel really clearly. And also, I mean, supposedly, right, when you get, when someone gets to tenure, it should be because they've really proven uh, that they are, um, that they are a stunning, that they are a stunning colleague, right? That was their language, a stunning colleague. You want to yes. be able to say these colleagues of mine are just extraordinary. They're stunning and how good they are. Yeah. That's so what I they're wanna, going for as the elite. Yeah, I want to talk about that. <laughs> yeah, please. <laughs> I want to talk about it because I feel like we should have talked about it earlier. Yeah. Um, because we can't. Did you just we give me 360 feedback on my performance <laughs> as an interviewer? You're saying I should have front loaded the conversation <laughs> with standing in place. Okay, uh, fine. Jason, you asked me the question in the wrong way. I would order. like to have <laughs> at least three guests who've been on the podcast give me feedback before I take yours, Aaron. <laughs> just so I make sure that it's universal and it's not just something about you. Because it could be about you. You might be projecting. Who knows? Thank you. But okay, Thank no, you. tell us about <laughs> right. Tell us about it. Okay. Because normally we shouldn't talk about candor or about freedom until we talk about talent density, right? Yes. Okay. You, yes, you can't do this with a bunch of dipshits. You, you, you give a bunch of idiots <laughs> who are dumb and who have never had, or are not adults, if they're acting like kids, you give them unlimited vacation policy and unlimited travel policy, like, all right, YOLO. Right. Yeah, so that's like the whole foundation of this. So if we kind of go back to what then, okay, so Reed had this epiphany, okay, I'm going to open up Netflix, give people a lot of freedom. But he also um, realized, like, I guess all the entrepreneurs listening to, the, or to the, the podcast, that at a point, there's enough, there's so much complexity in the company, that if you don't put process in place, that the organization is going to descend into mayhem. Um, so he tried to think about how to mitigate that. And he thought, okay, well, 
you know, in most organizations, uh, the top performers, they don't really need a lot of rules and process. We put those things in place in order to deal with the kind of like less amazing people. So what if we tried to create a work environment that really was, you know, as much as possible, only those top performers, then we could give them a lot, a lot more freedom, right? And then what if we got this candor going, which would increase talent density more, which would allow us to give more freedom, right? So that was the, that, that's the, the whole, the whole belief uh, behind it. And the term talent density, I mean, a lot of people say, okay, well, that's great for Netflix. <laughs> It's great right. for Unlimited Netflix. budgets. They got a money printing machine in the corner. That's with, right. And they're just shoveling $100 <laughs> bills, right. you know, like with, with giant bulldozers into like a warehouse of $100 bills. They got unlimited resources. Easy exactly. to say. Exactly. Right. And they right. always Those overpay, right? That was the other thing. When you talk about talent density, talk about these insane stories of recruiters calling and what the instructions were <laughs> when a recruiter called you at Netflix. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Crazy. We get there. Okay. So the, you know, may, I guess, um, I guess Jason, a lot of our, your podcast listeners are maybe engineers. I don't know. I mean, if they well, are the founders, startups, yeah. yeah. Some of them are okay. introverted, you know, technicians and other ones are sales executives and marketers who start companies, but yes, it's all startups. Okay, so I did not know about the rock star principle, but I know now that apparently most uh, most software engineers do know about that principle. So, uh, so the principle being that um, if you, um, based on an interesting research project, but that if you take the top software engineer, uh, that person is likely to pr to provide more value than ten to twenty five times the median engineer, right? So if you have a certain amount of money and you could hire like eight medium engineers, uh, you might instead pool all that money together and hire one rock star. Right. Um, so Reed took that that idea and he believed that that would be true for anybody who was in a creative environment, which makes sense. Right. If you are sure. looking for that, if you want to be as mar as successful at marketing as possible, well, hire one amazing marketer and you might find that that person will have bet more impact than like 25 medium ones. Right. Um, so that's the idea. And the idea was you want to hire you want to find the best the best person, uh, pay them really as much as possible as necessary, not as much right. as possible. Well, if you pay <laughs> them twice as much and they're a 10x developer, you know, they, uh, when one person looks at that, they say, oh my God, you're paying double. That makes no sense. And another person says, well, you got 80%, you accrued 80% of the value to the company by paying them double. If they are in fact 10x. That's right. So the idea was, you know, let's have a lot less employees and use our money to pay them a lot more. Right. And that's what talent density means. Right. So then we can give them more freedom. We've got more, more energy in the organization. And, uh, we find that the kind of the energy, the energy spirals up. Right. And that leads to one of my favorite uh, research pieces. <laughs> <laughs> which is this idea that um, that performance is contagious. Do you mind if I tell that, Jason? Yeah, please. <laughs> okay, so um, I had this um, this colleague, a business professor at another business school, and he did this research where he invited uh, four MBA students into his lab at a time. He uh, gave them a task and he rewarded them financially based on how well they performed. But unbeknownst to them, on 50% of the teams, there was an interloper. And this interloper, Confederate. that's right, <laughs> this interloper named Nick. So Nick was an actor, right? He'd been hired, a young actor, he'd been hired to act just like an MBA student, um, but to behave in a way that was a little bit like unamazing. So sometimes he would act kind of bored, like put his feet up on the table and text his mom, right? Or sometimes he would, sometimes he would act kind of jerky. Like he might say to the other MBA students, like, have you ever even attended an MBA class before, right? And what was, what was fascinating is that um, Professor Phelps showed uh, on team after team after team, that even when the top the other MBA students on the team were, let's say, top of their class, that those teams with Nick on them performed at a 45% worse rate. And more interesting than that is that you can see that during these 45 minutes, the other three MBA students, they start to behave like him. 
right? Like, like Nick. So like when Nick is behaving like a, a depressive pessimist, you can see that they come in, the other MBA students, they're really energized, but within 20 minutes, they're starting to look really bored. <laughs> There's one video where you can see one of the MBA students actually put her head down on the table. <laughs> she gets so tired. I guess Nick has just like sapped all the life out of her. <laughs> um, and when he starts to act jerky, the others on the team act jerky too, right? But not just to him. That's the thing. They start acting jerky to one another. So, I mean, we, I think when we think about it, we all can say, oh yeah, I've experienced that kind of thing. But the, the issue is that in companies, most of us think about an individual performance problem as an individual problem, right? So we think, okay, if this guy is not doing a great job, that's an issue between him and me, his boss, right? But an individual performance problem is not an individual problem. It's a systemic problem that impacts the entire, the, the energy, the creativity, the performance of the entire team, or maybe even of the entire organization, right? So that's, that's why. That's the no jerk a- rule. Yeah. You, you, <laughs> you, and it's like regression to the mean or what I tell people is like, when I was a runner, I used to run with people who were just faster, and I would run faster. And then I ran with another group that ran slow, and I would run slower. And when I was running with the slower group, I was in more pain. But being the last person in the group of five or six really fast runners was a I, my performance was much better than being the lead runner in the slow group. And I much preferred being last, you know, that, that's why I hang out with people who are much more successful than me. That's Which right. why I do the podcast. I get to have smart people like you on, and then it just <laughs> r- raises my average. <laughs> up. But it is true, right? Like you, the company you keep is something we've heard. You know, like it actually really matters. And and jerks and B players really infuriate A players. And that kind of disruption, whether it's de- you know acting depressed or being a jerk, whatever it is, people will model it around you. You'll just sap the energy out of the room. It's really important for leaders to be positive uh, and optimistic and candid. And it really falls on them to set that example, right? That's right. And of course, okay, so at Netflix, they say no brilliant jerks, which maybe does take care of Nick. But right. uh, your point is, um, which is, I think, the overwhelming lesson is that um when you have lower performers on your team, they just bring down the entire team. And that's why, I mean, we have to go back to this really harsh expression that I started with, which is adequate, severance. Yeah, adequate performance gets a generous severance. And that's not to, uh, to, you know, to create this environment where people are like sweating, am I going to get fired? It's in order to create this environment where people are like, oh my gosh, I love coming to work because I'm surrounded by so so much talent. And, you know, that is actually what I see there. Stay tuned for part two with Aaron Meyer, releasing later this week.